So dear noble ones, welcome to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking and today we have a lot to say because the title of this video has already told you that we're talking about a very interesting topic and that is the Moors. Now, the reason why there is a lot to say is because people say a lot about this civilization, this people and I think it's important to present valid documented evidence coming directly from the sources and real historical knowledge because unfortunately there are some creators that have agendas when it comes to the Moors. Agendas are like smells. Everybody has one but not everybody likes to own theirs. A very recent example is the video The Truth About the Moors by the well-known YouTuber Metatron. Sadly it is riddled with half-truths and dangerous falsehoods dangerous because these falsehoods are commonly exploited today in the denigration of black populations across North Africa. Everybody has an agenda. Whatever Metatrons is, we can only guess. But rest assured, everybody has an agenda. The following is an agenda to clarify and correct, to rehabilitate the distorted image of the maligned and marginalized, the wounded and the whitewashed, but still the undefeated the inexorable and the indigenous, the African. The word Mori, Moors, is an exonym, meaning a name that originates and is used outside of the context it defines. To simplify, the Moors did not identify themselves with this term. But who exactly were the Moors? Metatron starts his video with almost the exact same words as Wikipedia's entry on the Moors. No doubt an unfortunate coincidence, seeing as he has previously lectured against the use of Wikipedia in conducting historical research. I do not use Wikipedia, Quilimica, and to be honest, neither should you. At least if you want any academic value to your work. Agreed. But nevertheless, the fact that more is an exonym seems a redundant place to begin, seeing as the study of any group of people by outsiders nearly always necessitates the use of exonyms. The people of Japan know their nation as Nippon or Nihon, an endonym. Japan is a western corruption of what the ancient Chinese knew as Sipan. So Japan, like Sipan, is an exonym. And yet the Japanese do not quibble, allegedly. Is Metatron's opening on the Moors a useful clarification? Is it a vainglorious parade of bona fides? Or is it more strategic? Whatever his aim, the effect is to diminish the significance of the term more in his audience's eyes, as though it is not a particularly important term in and of itself, but it is. Properly examined, the word more and its near identical antecedents tell us more than Metatron goes on to explain. Listen because Moors is not a true ethnonym, but an artificial category conceived by Europeans in the Middle Ages, used until the modern age in a fairly variable manner to define people of Islamic faith, and to be more specific including those people that came from the Maghreb expanded into the Iberian Peninsula, including modern-day Spain, and conquered it. The word Mori derives from the Latin Mauri, which in turn comes from these Greek words. Now, in this case, so when we use the Latin word Mauri, then we are discussing a specific ethnic definition of Berber. Did you catch that? To downplay the English word more, only to then highlight its Latin progenitor Mauri, is more than a little uroboric. It's ridiculous. The word more is simply an anglicization of that very ancient term Maori, in the Greek Maoros, nothing more. To borrow from earlier, this would be like saying, don't pay any attention to the word Japan because it means nothing. Only pay attention to the older word Sipan, which the Chinese used. Why? Perhaps because Metatron is about to pivot onto saying that the older, more exotic sounding terms Maori and Maoros are more proper because they supposedly refer to Berbers, which he hopes to show you were largely a white or Caucasoid ethnic group, only with more tanned skin. Listen again. 
It should however be noted that even the term Maori seems to be used with some flexibility by the classics, and if initially it indicated a specific people of Morocco, later the definition seems to include also the Berber people of western central Algeria, eventually extending in late antiquity to all Berber people from Morocco to modern-day Tunisia. Now, digging a little deeper when it comes to the actual origins and etymology of the Greek word, it has been suggested in the past that it was possible that the origins were connected to a Phoenician word, so something used by the Carthaginians that meant Westerners, indicating all of those people and populations living west of them, so Carthage. Still, today, the most likely hypothesis points to this specific Greek adjective, which means dark, most likely in reference to the complexion of the Maori, understood as the original tribe mentioned by Herodotus and Pliny. Now, to avoid any possible misunderstanding of this, when I say that these people had a dark complexion, that doesn't automatically mean that they were black in the way we use the term modernly. The problem Metatron faces here is that there are many classical records, easily preceding the Middle Ages, which don't just use the word Maori, flexibly as Betatron claims, but instead describe the Maori very specifically as black people. Speaking of the Getulii themselves, the Romans took it for granted that they were by and large a black people of North Africa. This from the Roman author Juvenal, writing around 100 AD. Quote, Your cops will be handed you by a running footman from Getulia, or the bony hand of some moor so black that you would rather not meet him at midnight." Close quote. Here the Latin word translated as Moors by the classicist Lewis Evans is Maori, and the word used to describe the Moors' hand is Negri, literally black, not dark-skinned, which would have been Tenebris Cuti. 4th century Roman writer Claudian. Quote, when tired of each noblest matron, Gildo hands her over to the Moors. Married in Carthage city, the Sidonian mother's needs must mate with barbarians. He thrusts upon me an Ethiopian as a son-in-law, a Berber as a husband. The hideous half-breed child affrights its cradle." Close quote. Claudian seems in no doubt that the Moors were a class of Ethiopians. Consequently, his epic's prejudiced character bemoans the fact that Gildo, leader of the Moors, will force on him Ethiopian son-in-laws by giving Sidonian women to Moorish men, men he calls Barbar, or in English, and for the edification of Metatron, Berber. And the abominable result of all this? Mixed race offspring which Claudian's character isn't too keen on. From this alone, it is clear that Metatron offers his listeners a crude and ultimately false distinction between Maori and Ethiops, a common mistake, if a mistake, made by those who have only a superficial knowledge of how the classical world used and understood these terms. Yes, Ethiops was more readily used to describe people originating from deeper within Africa, but the term applied to different nations or tribes of Ethiops, which, surprise surprise, were most concentrated, homogeneous and unmixed the deeper into Africa you went. But still, this did not preclude you from finding vast bodies of people you could class as Ethiops settled elsewhere in the world, certainly not in ancient Africa. As proof, listen to how Greek traveller and geographer Diodorus Siculus digresses from speaking of other Ethiopic nations known to the ancient world. Quote, but there are also a great many other tribes of the Ethiopians, some of them, and especially those who dwell along the Nile River, are black in colour and have flat noses and woolly hair." Close quote. Evidently, black people existed elsewhere in Africa and the world. According to Diodorus, many of them were settled on either side of the Nile, and among these were others yet, particularly distinct in appearance, having flat noses and woolly hair. Phenotypic variety aside, all were Ethiops, black Africans. Clearly then, the words Maori and Ethiops overlap. A person could be an Ethiops and not a Moor. Just like today, a person can be black and not a Gambian. 
whereas a Moor, properly speaking, was always a class of Ethiopians, just like a Gambian today, more likely than not, is a member of the quote-unquote black community. To further demonstrate this index of A History of the Wars by Byzantine historian Procopius says, quote, Moor, a black race of Africa, see such and such for an account of their origin in Palestine and migration westward, driven away from Carthage, close quote. Yes, you heard correctly, Carthage. What's more, this old abridgment, like others of its time, seems to have viewed Palestine as a northeasterly extremity of Africa, something that is conveniently forgotten today by those who artificially limit the historical range of black people groups, naturally. Speaking of Procopius, in his History of the Wars, he too describes the Moors in physiognomic terms. Quote, and I have heard this man say that beyond the country which he ruled, there was no habitation of men, but desert land extending to a great distance, and that beyond that, there are men not black-skinned like the Moors, but very white in body and fair-haired. Close quote. Procopius, A History of the Wars, Book 4 Whatever region of North Africa Procopius is speaking of, once again, it is clear to him that the Moors were black-skinned. And to be sure, Procopius is a Roman-era writer of Greco-Syrian origin. His word for black-skinned here centers on the word melas and is translated straightforwardly by most translators as black-skinned, not dark-skinned. As a useful aside, that Greek word melas is where we get the English word melanin. Thus to say, as Metatron does, that the Moors were tendentiously described as dark-skinned and not black is particularly misleading, more so because the somatic norm for the ancient Greeks and Romans was already quite dark. That is to say, in skin tone, the Greeks and Romans were, as they are today, on the darker end of the spectrum as far as Europeans are concerned. They were certainly not Nordics. Hard then to believe that when they speak ad nauseum of the Moors as being Melas and Nigri and Ethiops, they are only remarking on a skin tone that is at most half a shade tanner than theirs, much less convoluted to take the words they used at face value and accept they were describing black people. A strange error to make for a self-described linguistic expert. Quote, Marula has made you, sinner, the father of seven children. I will not say freeborn, for not one of them is either your own or that of any friend or neighbor, but all being conceived on menial beds or mats betray by their looks the infidelities of their mother. This one who runs towards us so like a moor with his crisped hair, while that other one with flattened nose and thick lips is the very image of Panicus the wrestler. Close quote. Roman playwright Martial in his Epigrams Book 6, Panicus or Paniculus was a renowned black wrestler in ancient Rome, Anethiops. The speaker here is accusing another man's wife of infidelity with black men, calling as evidence the resemblance of her offspring to Moors. He speaks of their kinky or crisped hair, their flat noses, thick lips, and likens one to a famous African athlete of the day. Once again, Martial is not writing in the Middle Ages. He is a Roman-era writer. Seeing as Metatron likes his historical documentation, there are more to hand. Specifically from a period when Rome is on its last legs, Islam is on the rise and Europe in decline. There is a Berber rebellion in North Africa against the Damascus-based Umayyad Empire. Listen to how the Berber Moors of the 8th century, clashing with the Caliph's mercenaries, are described in a near contemporary account known as the Mozarabic Chronicle. Quote, when they joined each other in battle at the Nava River, the Egyptian horses immediately recoiled in flight, as the Moors on their beautiful horses revealed their repulsive collar and gnashed their white teeth. Close quote. A much later account, the 13th century text Historia Arabium by the historian Rodrigo Jimenez de Rada, 
clarifies the Chronicle's account in its own retelling. Again, pay close attention to Derada's description of the Berber rebels. Quote, they jumped out of the mountains naked with clothes just hanging around their private parts, black-skinned, kinky-haired and white teeth. The Moors' horrible colour on their beautiful horses and gnashing white teeth deterred the multitude of the hostile army. Close quote. As you just heard, well into the medieval era, the Spanish chronicler Jimenez de Rada understood just who the Berber Moors of the Mozarabic Chronicle were black Africans, and in touching on the story, he makes this fact unambiguous by his description of them. One wonders what Dorada's agenda was. Unfortunately, there are some creators that have agendas when it comes to the Moors. If you're still following and happen to like this video's agenda, then hit that like button and subscribe. Want to help expose the fact that Africans, like any other peoples, have long been boundless explorers and innovators? Then become a member and join the Trill Black channel today. And if you're simply stunned by what you've heard so far, you really shouldn't be. It should not surprise anybody that black Africans dominated and were indigenous to North Africa in antiquity. After all, it's Africa. But on to another troubling claim Metatron makes seconds into his agenda-free video. So when we use the Latin word Maori, then we are discussing a specific ethnic definition of Berber origins which, according to Herodotus, settled in Morocco and who, according to Pliny, had already been reduced to just a few families due to several wars by the 1st century AD. Confident that we can rule out the possibility that Herodotus has been editing his work from beyond the grave, we can also say there is no such mention of Metatron's claim anywhere in the famous text, The Histories. Herodotus speaks of the Persians, the Egyptians, the Indians and a whole host of other peoples. Never once does he mention the term Moors, nor Morocco, nor even the term Morusoi. Not a single line. The closest you'll find to Metatron's bizarre claim is in this crude summation by an AI-generated answer on Google but you will get nothing verbatim on the Mauros from Herodotus. Surely Metatron has not left his research up to Google's experimental AI software. It may be that his claim can be corroborated. However, it would help if Metatron actually provided his sources either in the body of his video or in the video's description below, book, line and paragraph. Perhaps what Metatron is haphazardly referring to is Herodotus' mention of the Libyans. If so, then surely he would know that the Greek historian says this about the indigenous peoples of the vast North African region known to the ancient world as Libya. Quote, These be the Libyan tribes whereof I am able to give the names, and most of these cared little then, and indeed care little now, for the king of the Medes. One thing more also I can add concerning this region namely that, so far as our knowledge reaches, four nations, and no more, inhabit it, and two of these nations are indigenous, while two are not. The two indigenous are the Libyans and Ethiopians, who dwell respectively in the north and the south of Libya." Close quote. Herodotus is clear that there are two indigenous peoples inhabiting the region of North Africa known then to him and the ancient world as Libya. Another two are relative newcomers. Herodotus claims that the second of the indigenous two were a more inland nation of Libyans that he describes as Ethiops. And no, Herodotus is not speaking of black Africans south of the Sahara. So far as academics know, the ancient Greek traveller and historian was not privy to any information about sub-Saharan Africa outside of the Ethiopic kingdoms further up the Nile. Regardless, his insights are still useful. For example, in a second quote, Herodotus says this of the indigenous blacks of Libya, quote, The Eastern Ethiopians, for two nations of this name served in Xerxes' army, were marshalled with the Indians. They differed in nothing from the other Ethiopians, save in their language 
and the character of their hair, for the Eastern Ethiopians have straight hair, while they of Libya are more woolly haired than any other people in the world." Close quote. Herodotus, like Diodorus Siculus would also later observe, seems to be remarking on the great diversity of genetic phenotype that occurs among Africans. Here he is noting something that can still be observed today, namely the even greater concentration of phenotypic diversity in East Africa, which often results in the straighter and silkier hair texture you can find among Oromos, Eritreans, Tigrayans and Somalis, to name but a few. This hair texture he contrasts with the Ethiopic Libyans to the west, which according to him is far kinkier and more stubborn. Here the question can be raised legitimately, does Metatron not know of these accounts, or does he and yet conveniently sidesteps them? Impossible as that would reek of an agenda. Unfortunately, there are some creators that have agendas when it comes to the Moors. These are not the only ancient and near ancient sources that speak of blacks widespread and indigenous to North Africa. There are many more, but we are in danger of beating the proverbial dead horse. It suffices to say that well before the Middle Ages, the Moors were known to be a black people of North Africa. In fact, so notorious were they for their blackness that what appears to have first been a vague Phoenician word, Mahorin, meaning Westerners, came to be synonymous with blackness. Par for the course, when you consider that those Westerners happened to be North Africans, west of places like Tyre and Sidon, who simply wouldn't stop turning up black, and well into the Middle Ages. It would appear then that the words English incarnation, more, is not merely a valueless exonym, it literally documents the historical metamorphoses of a specific people group. Did the word more later become a generic reference to the Islamized inhabitants of North Africa, whether lighter skinned or black African? Undoubtedly, but unlike the problem the chicken and the egg poses, we can clearly see which usages of the word came first, in very specific order. And well into the medieval era, the Moors were still known to the world as black Africans, even though adjacent populations could also acknowledge their recent Islamization. Isidore of Seville was a bishop and clerical scholar during the Middle Ages. He lived in a Spain which had increasing conflicts with these aggressive and warlike black tribes from North Africa. In his famous work, The Etymologies, he says this, quote, The Medes mingled with those Libyans who lived closest to Spain. Little by little, the Libyans altered the name of these people in their barbarous tongue, calling the Medes Moors, Mauros, although the Moors are named by the Greeks for their color, for the Greeks call black Mauros, and indeed, blasted by the blistering heat, the Moors have a countenance of a black color." Close quote. Isidore explains that the gradual change in language already taking place in his time is due to the bastardization of the word more in its application to newcomers, a people emigrating from modern day Iran. But he stresses that more means black in reference to the original people of North Africa. And as you can see, some of Metatron's viewers were keen to take to their keyboards to support Isidore's point in the previous quote. To date, Metatron has yet to respond. But back to Isidore. He says elsewhere in his etymologies that quote, the Moors have bodies black as night, while the skin of the Gauls is white. Close quote. This is particularly interesting when you read the wider passage this quote is taken from. Within it, Isidore reasons that people's phenotypic characteristics are intertwined with their ethnic appellations, and he considers the word more to be an apt appellation for the black peoples of North Africa seeing as the word Mauros had long come to mean black among the Greeks. Again, black and not merely dark skinned. This type of word evolution happens all the time. Language experts call it a metonym. It's defined by Google as quote, a word, name or expression used as a substitute for something else with which it is closely associated. For example, 
Washington is a metonym for the US government. Close quote. In terms of color, think orange, an amber colored fruit whose name we use every day to refer to a specific color. Metonymy is exactly why the Greeks and Romans had so many different words that came to mean black. For example, the proper, much older Latin word for black is not nigri or this word where we get our word negro and far more offensive terms. Instead, the proper Latin word for black was atra and its derivatives such as atrati meaning blackened. Incidentally, this word is what Roman traveller Ammianus Marcellinus called the Egyptians of his day. Another word which came in the Latin to mean black is the word fervus, from which we get our word fur and furtive. The complicated evolution of this word is documented by Roman grammarian Aulus Cornelius Gellus, who in Book 2 of his Attic Nights explains that, quote, fur is so called because the early Romans used fervus for atur, the word black, and thieves steal most easily in the night, which is black. Close quote. In this way, Gallius explains the popular thinking of how fervus, which seemed to predate atra for meaning black, became synonymous with the jet black coating of a type of rodent. Further in the text, Gallus goes on to wonder which came first, observations of the animal's color or the word itself. But let's leave Gallus with his musings. Beyond the Middle Ages, across the European world, another word was coming to replace more when used for black people, whether North African or otherwise. It too was antiquated in origin, it too came from the classical world, and it too was a metonym. We very recently touched on it. It's this word, nigri or nigra or sometimes negrita. How and why did this other more popularized word for black develop? Experts have long answered that by going deep into Africa, as far inland as, yes, Nigeria. Not far from this location, Roman interactions with black peoples on the more southerly edges of the Sahara led to the discovery of a word the locals used for the river they lived near to and themselves, their endonym. The word was Ger, which in turn the Romans malappropriated into Nigre. In time, this word also came to synonymize black, just like the word Moor did. Late Roman geographer and mathematician Ptolemy famously catalogues this fact when he speaks of a great river further west of the Nile, which the natives knew as Gur, or as we would know it today, the river Niger. That word is what the Berber Tamashek nation of today know as Geren, meaning the river of rivers or king of rivers, apt seeing as the river Niger is the third longest river in all of Africa. Ironically enough for Metatron, nobody today denies that the Tamashek Berbers are black Africans, notwithstanding the presence of some lighter skinned subgroups. Speaking of the Berbers, let's revisit Metatron's video. Now, the same can be said about the Berber world, in the sense that as we read the ancient sources, specifically the Greek ones, we have mentions of populations that are, in fact, mixed, such as, for example, the above-mentioned Melano Gaetuli, but also the Leuca Ethiopes, which, as we know, were settled in the area of present-day Morocco. Notice anything? Herr Metatron seems to be saying something quite different to what he had previously said about the Melano Gaetuliae and the Luca Ethiopes. Listen. The terms that are normally used to indicate black people from Africa are not the same terms that are used to indicate this type of population, so the Maori. And as a proof of this, when we read Diodorus Siculus, as he tells us about a specific population, the Asphodels living in Tunisia, that's where they had their settlements, but these people are black. In fact, he uses this term to identify them, particularly when he's comparing them to other populations such as the Melano Gaetuli that Ptolemy, for example, tells us about. Metatron claimed these two groups of ancient North Africans were different from the Ethiops living in a place called Asphodel, who according to him, Diodorus deems a black group of North Africans. But later on, he says that the Melano Gaetuli were a mixed group of blacks and whites. 
Can you see the contradiction? Without statistical specifics, Mixed easily suggests that the Milano-Gaetuliae and the Luca Ethiopes were a 50-50 ethnic combination of blacks and whites, or something not far off that ratio. This group cannot possibly be the best example for Metatron's idea that Berbers have always been predominantly whites with tan skin. What's more, the black infusion and ethnic contribution to this mixed group would certainly have to have been more significant than the rest of Metatron's video goes on to imply, if the ancients were adding prefixes to their names such as Milano and Ethiops. These were terms which when used by the ancient Greeks and Romans in Africa usually refer to the black inhabitants of the continent. So what's really going on with the Milano Gatulia and the Luca Ethiops? The truth is more complex than Metatron presents. The two ethnic groups have been part of an ongoing debate among European scholars for quite some time. Frank M. Snowden was a renowned historian whose work focused on the reach and influence of blacks in the classical world and on that topic he adopted a very conservative approach. But even he had to admit that the Milano Gaetuliae and Luca Ethiopes were a quote, kind of intermediate population, an amalgam of white and Ethiopian. Close quote. Reasonable, but certainly a far better attempt at squaring the circle than many others before and after him. But to solve the problem of why the true identity of the Milano Gaetuliae and the Luca Ethiopes have eluded experts for so long and who they actually were, we must look to two respective answers. The first might present uncomfortable feelings for some sensitive viewers. If that sounds like you, Please look away now. Unfortunately, there are some creators that have agendas when it comes to the Moors. Our first answer has its roots in white supremacy. Academics call it the true Negro theory. Our second answer centers on the regions of Africa these two mysterious and ancient Berber peoples were said to inhabit. Both answers are intertwined. Here's how. In attempting to separate the ancient Egyptians ethnically from black Africans, the eminent 19th century authority Charles Anthon made one of the most constipated statements you will ever hear. In his work, A Classical Dictionary, he admitted that the Egyptians and Ethiopians were quote, natives of the same race, but then went on to declare that the Egyptians were still not necessarily Negroes. In aid of this, Anthon claimed quote, in complexion, it seems the race was a counterpart of the Fullers in the west of Africa, nearly in the same latitude. The blacker Fullers resemble in complexion the darkest people of the Nile. They are of a deep brown or mahogany color. The fairest of the Fullers are not darker than the Copts or even than some Europeans. Close quote. Charles Anthon, trying to separate the Egyptians from black Africans by likening them to the Fullers of West Africa, shot himself in the foot. The Fullers look like this, ranging as he admits somewhat from very light-skinned blacks with semi-kinky hair to almost jet black in appearance having the tightest of curls. No serious ethnologist or anthropologist would claim these people are anything but part of the black family, despite their diverse range of appearance. But in trying to separate Egypt from black Africa, Anthon fell into what academics call the true Negro trick. Former professor of economics and Afro-American studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee describes the true Negro trick this way, quote, persons or groups of persons who do not have every characteristic ascribed to the true Negro, though they may have 90% of them, are somehow not real Negroes, but instead are in reality part of the Caucasian race. When anthropologists have applied these statistically unsound methods to white populations, they have found also that the true white, presumably the Nordic, does not exist. Such slipshod analysis basically has been ignored when European history and culture have been studied. But the same type of unsound analysis has been the cornerstone of studies dealing with African populations. 
In short, the concept of race as applied to African populations has been used in a way that allows for practically no variation in physical types, while on the other hand, almost infinite variation is allowed in defining Caucasians. Thus, very fair Nordics from Northern Europe and swarthy, almost brown, Southern Europeans are both classified as Caucasians without referring to either as a true Caucasian. Close quote. And here is how the true Negro trick betrays the identity of the most mysterious Melanogaetuliae and Luca Ethiops. It just so happens that the region documented by the ancients as being the home of these people is an approximation of the same region the Fullers inhabit today. This from Pliny the Elder's famous tome, Geographies. Quote, if we pass through the interior of Africa in a southerly direction beyond the Gatuliae, after having traversed the intervening deserts, we shall find the country where the Luca Ethiopians dwell. Beyond these are the Negrite, nations of Ethiopia, so called from the river Nigris. Close quote. Luca means the color white in Greek or light in Latin. Ethiopes refers to black Africans. Believe it or not, the Greeks and Romans were not as blinkered as modern Western academia has become by centuries of ingrained supremacist notions like the true Negro theory. They were not seriously saying that deep within Africa, adjacent to the Negrite Ethiopians, were a group of white black people. Ridiculous indeed. Better then to see the Luca Ethiops as lighter skinned black Africans who dwelled in exactly the same region as they do today. In the lower half of the Sahara and in the Sahel regions of places like northern Nigeria, Niger, Burkina Faso and Mali. These are the people Charles Anthon was loathed to admit were black Africans. These aren't just the surmisals of a faceless voice on the internet. This was the opinion of past hard copy editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Quote, the kingdom of the Fullers is governed by a Muslim sovereign, but the bulk of the people appear to be pagans. From the circumstances of their long hair, their lips and comparatively light colour, Major Rennell is decidedly of the opinion that the Fullers are the Luca Ethiops of Ptolemy and Pliny. The former places the Luca Ethiops in the nation occupied today by the Fullers, and by the name which he gave them, Luca Ethiops, he evidently meant to describe a people less black than the generality of Ethiopians. Close quote. Conversely, we can think of the Milano Gatuliae as a particularly black branch of the Gatulians, perhaps part of the modern day Tamashek, who inhabit a cross section between the blackest Berber groups and other much lighter groups. To look at some Tamashek, Juvenal's idea of a Gatulian footman so black you would rather not meet him at midnight makes some sense. All this aside, Metatron cited barely any historical sources for the description of the Berbers in past times. The following might be why. Dr. Dana Reynolds Marniche is a well-travelled anthropological and historical expert on the Moors and the ancient Berber peoples. A Columbia alumnus, she is published in numerous peer-reviewed journals. Books she has worked on have been nominated for the Pulitzer and other books of hers are endorsed by Harvard and Oxford academics. She spoke to the Trill Black Channel recently and pointed us in the direction of early to late medieval sources describing the original Berbers before they intermixed with relative newcomers to the region. She had this to say about the Masmuda Berbers. The Masmuda up until the 14th and 15th century were described as black skinned people. Dr. Dana's claim is indeed backed up by historical sources. The following is taken from the Safar Nama, or the Book of Travels. It was written by medieval Persian historian and geographer Nasser Khusro at around 1050 AD. In the volume, Khusro describes the major blocks composing the armies of Egypt's longest reigning Fatimid Caliph, a black man of Nubian origin named al munstansar Bilah. Quote, the third faction is that of the Masmudi Berbers. They are blacks from the country of Masmud. They are 20,000, I was assured. 
If from Egypt we go south and we go beyond Nubia, we arrive at the country of the Masmudi, a vast region covered with pastures and filled with herds. The inhabitants who have black skin are of a vigorous build." Close quote. Still, Dr. Dana went for broke and surprised the Trill Black nation with even more. Although all Berbers at one time or another were described as black complexioned people, Again, historical documentation supports this claim. Ibn Khaldun was one of the most respected Arab historians and philosophers of the late Middle Ages. He wrote of not just the Masmudas, but all the Berber peoples as being part of one black race, cursed by God with black skin, in his opinion as a result of the biblical account of Noah's estrangement with his son, Ham. Ibn Khaldun wrote this, quote, Ham, having become black because of a curse pronounced against him by his father, fled to the Maghreb to hide in shame. Berber, son of Kalushim, one of his descendants, left numerous posterity in the Maghreb. Khaldun goes on, quote, Now the real fact, the fact which dispenses with all hypothesis, is this. The Berbers are the children of Canaan, the son of Ham, son of Noah. Close quote. If only it did dispense with all hypotheses. Unfortunately, there are some creators that have agendas when it comes to the Moors. For the edification of Metatron, we will offer one more quote. This from Arab Christian theologian and physician Ibn Butlan, writing in the 11th century AD. Quote, the Berber women are from between the west and the south. Their color is mostly black, aswad, though some pale ones can be found among them. If you can find one whose mother is of Kutama, whose father is of Sanhaja, and whose origin is Masmuda, then you will find her naturally inclined to obedience and loyalty in all matters." Close quote. As early as the 11th century, well before Europe's transatlantic slave trade had begun, the extreme slaving practices of Arab culture was devastating northern Africa causing mass displacements and chaos among indigenous black African populations who regularly warred with one another and subsequently traded each other across Islam's brave new world. The scale of this trafficking and its dislocating effect on the population of North Africa cannot be understated. It changed the face of the region forever. But before Metatron goes on to emphasize African slaves, brought from further within Africa by Moorish and Arab conquest, he engages in what might just amount to bare-faced falsification. This is the oldest surviving depiction of Moorish general and leader, the Emir Abu Bakr ibn Umar, whose prosperous reign prepared the way for the Almoravid invasion of Spain. Ibn Umar is often credited with having founded the Moroccan city of Marrakesh, originally as a military outpost. His children are described by many historical sources as being exceptionally black-skinned, naturally so, being offspring of their black mothers. You can find this image of Ibn Umar on a 1413 Portuguese atlas. It clearly depicts an extraordinarily black man riding through a region roughly meant to represent North Africa. Above him, you can also read the words Rex Abubakar or King Abubakar in English. This much couldn't be clearer. And yet, when Metatron chooses to represent Ibn Umar to his audience, he chooses a modern AI-generated image presenting him this way. Watch. This of mixed marriages in the Maghreb, already attested in the Berber context and subsequently encouraged by the polygamy that characterized Islam, came to involve even high social classes, and the Moroccan historian Muhammad ibn Idhari, writing in the 13th century, reports that the leader of the Almoravid dynasty, Abu Bakr ibn Umar, originally from the Berber tribe of Lamtuna, it's particularly difficult to excuse this as agenda neutral when a historically accurate image of Ibn Umar is readily available via a simple Google search. By presenting the AI-generated image as opposed to the more likely faithful representation of Ibn Umar, Metatron's efforts appear as part of a long line of attempts to downplay the Africanicity of the Moors. 
the same tradition that sees this unidentified traveller from a completely different medieval atlas falsely labelled by Google Commons as Ibn Umar. Metatron's AI image of course serves his overarching message which he reaches at the 11.07 minute mark of his video. Still, however, it is important to understand that except for these particular cases, the presence of individuals clearly identifiable as black must have been relatively limited within the totality of the Moorish reality. And while they are not absent in the 13th century miniatures of the Battle of San Esteban, the Gormath, fought in 997, they still represent a component, not the totality. If Metatron is relying on iconography to demonstrate this limited reality, then it's only fair to let him in on a little secret. Many key figures from Moorish history and legend are depicted in the earliest iconography available to us today as black Africans. Not just key figures, but whole historical events are depicted as centering on black Africans, including famous battles and sieges, not merely involving isolated factions of armies, as Metatron claims in his video, but whole armies along with their cavalry composed entirely of black Africans. These images range across a vast stretch of time from the earliest periods of human activity in North Africa up until the Renaissance era where North Africa begins to change more dramatically with the rise of Turkic Ottoman domination. Take a look. But we are not at the end of Metatron's agenda-free video. Listen. Is. Moreover, it's important to keep in mind that in most cases, when substantial groups of black individuals are indicated in the Moorish forces, they almost always belong to a very specific social class. If we exclude the army of the mysterious king of Sudan, Rai bin Rai, all subsequent militias consisting of black fighters are of armed slaves, according to a common practice in the Islamic world, which is the same that had been given rise to the caste of Mamluks, in this case, white slaves of Circassian origin in Egypt. And as further evidence of this, there are several Christian sources that speak about the specific battle, the Battle of Las Navas, which occurred in 1212, and as they describe the tent of the Caliph in command, they tell us that he has a guard made specifically of black people, and these people are slaves as it's indicated by the golden chains that they wear. And in order to commemorate the subsequent Christian victory of this battle, golden chains were placed on the coat of arms of the House of Navarre, as we can see on this image. That's the origin of those golden chains. Not for the first time the truth is in what Metatron leaves out. In his haste to diminish the Africanicity of Moorish civilization, Metatron omits crucial details. The Battle of Las Navas was indeed a factual event. However, accounts of it subsequently became heavily fictionalized and mythologized, an attempt to add to the luster of the famous Christian reconquest of Spanish lands. 
A cursory investigation on Wikipedia will reveal this much. Besides, if we are to believe Metatron's selective narrative, we would have to ignore the Moorish throngs repeatedly described as overwhelming masses of black infantry and cavalry by European medieval accounts, without mentioning slavery in the least bit. Seeing as Metatron likes his mythos, here is a segment of the Song of Roland found in the oldest extant work possessed by the French National Library. It describes the march of the Moors from Spain and into France. The Caliph who holds Alfern, Cartagena, Gamali and Ethiop, a cursed land indeed. The blackamoors from there are in his keep, broad in the nose they are and flat in the ear, 50,000 and more in company. These canter forth with arrogance and heat, then they cry out the pagans rallying chair. When Roland sees those misbegotten men, who are more black than ink is on the pen, with no part white, only their teeth except, then says that count, I know now very well, that here to die, we're bound, as I can tell. Close quote. This is not to say that slave soldiers and slavery were not a part of the Moorish reality. However, unlike the transatlantic slave trader, the Moors were equal opportunity slavers, indiscriminately enslaving blacks and whites, with the mass enslavement of Europeans being the subject of many records, historical and modern. Dr. Dana Reynolds Marniche spoke to the Moorish predilection for white slaving and how it transformed North African demographics in an interview with the Trill Black audience. Being in color. And ever since then, they've been going into North Africa, into the places of the white slave trade, because a large number of white people were brought into these areas, um, like Meknes in Morocco, and they've been taking DNA and saying, oh, look, the Berbers are related to Europeans. You know, the same, similar to what they did in, um, uh, with ancient Egypt, where there were certain towns that were occupied mainly by non-African people. They've done the same thing. Geneticists have gone and said, oh, these people were related to, you know, Turks. As ever, Dr. Dana is supported by the historical records. The famous Almoravid conqueror of Spain, Emir and General Yusuf ibn Tashfin, was a black man described over and over again for his strong black features in historical accounts corroborated by modern scholarship. Although this hasn't prevented modern reimaginings of Ibn Tashfin from whitewashing him, they are at least historically accurate when they cast Tashfin's favorite concubine as a white slave. She was. Early Moorish raids are recorded as having taken place all over Italy, Sicily and as far north as Irish and Viking coasts a fact that has led some to believe that the transatlantic slave trade was at its inception part of a retaliatory vendetta on the black faces that had terrorized whites for so long. A little popularized fact is that the European slave trade didn't just take place from the coasts of West Africa. Moorish captives and settlers left over in Spain and Portugal well after the fall of Cordoba were among the first to be forcibly transported to the Americas as slaves. This is attested to by an extraordinary American document in the legislative records of the United States, specifically the 1848 Negro Law of South Carolina. Quote, the term Negro is confined to slave Africans, the ancient Berbers and their descendants. Close quote. Extraordinary indeed, but a digression. Listen instead to this account from J.L. Stevens an American diplomat visiting a slave market in Istanbul in 1835. Quote, to my surprise I found there 20 or 30 white women. Bad, horrible as this traffic is under any circumstances to my habits and feelings, it loses a shade of its horrors when confined to blacks. But here, whites and blacks are exposed together in the same bazaar. Close quote. Sadly, many of these women were bought and then trafficked into Africa. Those whose unclothed bodies survived the baking Sahara sun went on to make up many a harem. And yet, there's more that Metatron keeps from his viewers. In emphasizing the enslavement of blacks by whites, he omits the hundreds of Moorish heads throughout Europe, heads which adorn the standards of many noble houses. These heads are not all trophy symbols, the defeated foes of the Christian Reconquistas. They couldn't all be. 
when often they are adorned with crowns and are the emblems of houses with patronymics such as Moore, Morehouse, Morrison, Schwartz and Schwarzkopf. As the 19th century author David MacRitchie pointed out, quote, nor can the Moors of heraldry be explained sufficiently by the theory that the founders of families bearing Moors as supporters and Moors heads as crests had won their spurs in assisting Spaniards to expel the Moor. The bearing among ancient coats of arms is too common to admit this explanation. Close quote. Instead, the implication is that these symbols were popular at a time when Europe's noble houses were keen to broadcast their exotic and illustrious ties to the Moorish kings and generals of old, whether real or imagined. When highlighting myths behind abstract emblems of golden chains, why does Metatron keep these emblems from his near 1 million subscribers? See them for yourself. And also, see the Moors who prospered in Europe, defying the Reconquista and their abandonment behind enemy lines. Similarly, in contemporary Moroccan society, where the predominant majority are of Arab lineage, we can still find some individuals that have black ancestry, and also those that will be called Haratine, a minority that still is present in the territory today. It is indicative that the word Haratine is mostly traced back to a compound in the Arabic language meaning recently freed, which would suggest a servile origin for this minority. This is the most egregious aspect of Metatron's video. At best, it betrays his superficial understanding of this topic. At the worst, it adds to suspicion of the worst of agendas. Haratin does not mean slave, captive or freed. Yes, the origins of the word have long been debated, but the suggestion that it is linked to a word in the Arabic meaning second class have been thoroughly debunked. Professor Chuki El Amel in his 2014 book Black Morocco says this, quote, A popular etymology falsely suggests that the name Haratin derives from a combination of two Arabic words, her and Tani. This study has problematized the status of the Haratin. It is indeed a story of great injustice against a particular group of Moroccans who happen to have a different complexion. Close quote. More likely, the word originates from a Berber word for black, Ahardan, plural Ihardin. And in truth, the Haratin are among the oldest indigenous Berber groups of North Africa, only pushed further south relatively recently by the successive invasions of lighter skinned Muslims such as the Turkic Ottomans. How do we know this? French anthropologist and traveller to the region Denise Jacques Menuet wrote in the 1600s that the Haratin were, quote, the descendants of black people who inhabited the Dra Valley since time immemorial." Close quote. Edward William Bovill in his book The Golden Trade of the Moors says this, quote, The Haritin possess some Negro features in their dark skin and kinky hair. The shape of their nose and face is often quite unlike that of the Negroes of the Sudan, and their blood group pattern is quite different from that of any other people in the Sahara or even the Sudan, but resembles that of the pygmies of the western Congo rainforest. 
Tentatively, it may be suggested that the Halatin contain among their ancestors people of that Negroid stock which inhabited the Sahara in Neolithic times. Close quote. And there you have it. The Halatin are likely part of the Gatulai Berbers spoken of by ancient travellers to the Sahara. Finally, the Halatin are not a minority, as Metatron claims. They make up the largest population block in their native Mauritania, 40% of the population and over 1.5 million people, although they are part of a persecuted subclass. Weaponized colorism and fake news narratives like Metatron's, of course, don't help. What Metatron and much of popular Western thought refuses to accept when it comes to black and indigenous history is that populations change over time and can do so incredibly rapidly. Ask the Native Americans, ask the Aboriginal people of Australia and ask the Caribou of the Caribbean. Apologies, not that last group. They were exterminated by European settlers long ago. Although this demographic change seems to be recognized when it comes to other groups, it never is with African groups, perhaps because it helps to serve an agenda that eases the consciences of some as they continue to loot and plunder black Africa till today. An agenda that once claimed Africans couldn't possibly have built the Great Walls of Zimbabwe, the Great Wall of Benin and its ivory and bronze sculptures. An agenda that today whispers back to itself. They were only slaves. Metatron's earliest content pursued the harmless enough agenda of curating antiquated weaponry. Perhaps he ought to return to his fantasy fencing and leave the narration of African history to those it affects the most, Africans. From Kush to Compton, this has been Trill Black, no doubt.